us on this Wednesday afternoon, a wet Wednesday in the Northeast. It's good to have you aboard as we begin a broadcast day here in a great series, XM82. Yours truly, Christopher Russo. The crew's in the house here today as we chat. Triple Eight Mad Dog Six. That's your two-way sports talk telephone number on this uh, mid Wednesday day, this mid May day on a Wednesday, the sixteenth day. Uh, as we take you home here, Steve Phillips a little bit later on in the baseball. We'll do that. Plenty of uh, little other potpourri items to get to in the course of our day. We started, of course, uh, with the National Basketball Association as we uh, do a program. Here. And I tell you, the weather, I can't believe this weather. I got a big golf tournament this weekend. Uh, and it looks like if I do play or if we do play at the course, we're going to be basically slogging through a, uh, a jungle with rain constantly. I mean, it just doesn't stop. I mean, it's rained essentially every day since. I mean, uh, here's a way to look at it. I don't want to complain for you, those Michael and San Diego out there uh, looking at the Pacific Ocean right now with a pina colada and an egg and an omelet. But the, the issue is I counted. We had five nice days in the month of April. That's it. In the Northeast, five. What, what I, and I would classify nice, you know, over 50 degrees and at least some sun. That, that would be nice. We had five of those in, um, in April. And I'll tell you, in May, it hasn't been that many. I mean, it's 15 days in. We probably, every third day, we get a nice day. I mean, it's mind-boggling. And we got people who are stir-crazy, can't do anything. I'm doing a program from uh, the abode today because Wednesday night is tennis, and that's been rained out. What else is new? And they rescheduled for Monday night. But I got to talk to you guys because we are on the air at 6 o'clock. I have baseball at 1 o'clock. So my schedule has been a mess, but I'll see if I can keep you home here and keep you occupied on this. Uh, on this midweek program. Let's start, of course, with uh, game two last night of the Celtics. And I think the first way I'll look at this is the way, uh, is to take it from a Boston perspective. You know, they have been sort of, in a lot of ways, maligned by a lot of the predictors and the bookmakers and Vegas and basketball fans now for a long period of time. They were a slight favorite against the Bucs. That's it. Minus 135, minus 140. A slight favorite against the Bucs. This is a team that's got Stevens that won 50-something games. But, you know, a lot of people were very worried about all the injuries. Now, they won. They beat, you know, they may have been right about that calculation because, as it turns out, they did have to play seventh ga- seven games against Milwaukee. And and, uh, you know, although the seventh game was relatively routine, uh, they did have to go the distance against the Milwaukee team and won 44-45 games. So they may have been accurate with that prediction. I'll give them that. Uh, I'll, but I'll, I'll be fair about it. I'll give them that. And they really could have lost uh, game one in that series. They won in overtime. They were fortunate. Uh, they also could have won a game in Milwaukee, too, um, uh, earlier on. I mean, Milwaukee got a last tip in basket by the freak, if you remember correctly. But the bottom line is they won in seven. So no real surprise there. And I can understand that price. But boy, oh, boy, they were really big underdogs against Philly. They were basically minus plus 400. I couldn't even get a bet in. Because lots of people, lots of people won't do anything with that. When it's over plus two fifty, they let they they don't get involved. I couldn't go near it. Couldn't find anybody who would take it. Uh, and I also like Philadelphia before the postseason started to win the Eastern Conference. I would have lost that too. So, but I couldn't get anybody to play that or take that bet for me. And as it turns out, you know, Boston, you know, won Game One uh, in a relatively close game. And even after they won the first game. They were still an underdog. Think about it. They won the first game, and you still got them at a plus after that in uh, in, a, in a series price. I mean, that is, I mean, that is a lack. I mean, Philadelphia is not that good. I mean, that, that is a lack of respect. And then, you know, after they won that second game, they basically were even. But they were nine point underdogs in game three. And that's the game they won in overtime. So they got no respect against Philadelphia in the second round. And they got no respect. And then I, so I didn't touch it, didn't bet it. And then finally I woke up and I said, geez, enough. I mean, it, it, Cleveland could have lost Indiana. And I'm going to treat the Toronto series from a Raptors standpoint with the Cavaliers as, you know, Toronto gets scared stiff when they see LeBron. So I'll treat that as that. I'll bet Boston in this next round. And you know what? They were a huge underdog again. They were plus 240 with home court. They were plus 240. I could see being maybe a, a, a little bit of an underdog. Plus 240 is a gigantic underdog. They were at plus 240. And, of course, uh, you know, they win the first game. And they're still a plus at 105 going into game two. And then they win game two. Now they have to be a minus. But, I mean, they've really gotten very little respect uh, from the people who should know better. And they have just been tremendous. They've won nine games. Let's see, four, three, nine games in a row in their building. 
They have the best, I think, best basketball coach in the world uh, manning their sidelines. And I say that with all due respect to guys like Popovich and Krzyzewski. But I think he's the best coach in basketball today. He is a tremendous coach. You know, he's began the year with basically eight new players. They won. And then he, he loses one of those new guys the first day of the season. He figures out a way to win 50 ga- 55 games. We all know about Kyrie Irving out of there after 60 games. The guy did an incredible job. Now, they got talent, and we give Ainge the credit because Jalen Brown's very, very good. He's going to be great. Rozier came out of nowhere, so he has done a superb job. Tatum, Ainge loves so much that he got him at the third pick and still was able to figure out a way to get a lottery pick out of that scenario. And Horford, I've underrated for a long time. So I got to keep my mouth shut about him. He's much better. And Marcus Smart can play on my team anytime he wants. He may not be the most lovable guy in America, but boy, he knows how to win. And he has used that, he has used these, these group, throwing a big kid from San Antonio Baines. And, you know, they have really figured out a way to manhandle the, the Cavaliers in these first two games. I mean, especially in half number two last night. They did a great job in game one. They blew out the Cavs right from the get go. They were up 25 to nine. Uh, and they won the game going away, which I thought was very significant considering the fact that Cleveland buried them a year ago. LeBron coming off a four game sweep and the game late in the year, Cleveland won easy. So I I thought it was very important for the Celtics to get off to a good start. They did do just that. And then, conversely, I thought it was a very, very important game for the Cavaliers to come out last night and and win. And I thought the winner of last night's game, I did not think Boston was out of it if they lost last night, but I, I did think that, um, you know, uh, I, I, was, I think Cleveland would have been in the driver's seat. And I think the fact that Boston won last night, I think, really puts Cleveland really completely behind the eight ball. And this is where we get to the Cavaliers. I don't buy the adage that Pat Raleigh said forever, and nobody loves Raleigh more than me. I don't buy the adage that Raleigh always used to say in best of sevens, the series does not begin until you lose a game on your home floor. See, the problem with that theory is if... The series does begin for the team that's got home court advantage because you don't have to win a game on the road to win a series. So the idea, okay, Cleveland, what have they lost? All right, we'll give them the three games at home. They still got to win a game in Boston. That's what home court advantage is all about. And they're going to have to show me now, the Cavaliers, that they can win there in that building. And that is why the Raleigh thing, I never really, I don't love it. I understand the theme because they win the next two games. They're right there again. But the problem with it is the the road team here, uh, Golden State's already won a game. The road team to win a series, the the, the team with the worst record, they have to win a game in the other guy's building. And if they don't, and in the NBA that's not easy, they're not winning. I don't care how well they play at home. And that's the uh, fallacy of the Raleigh argument. I mean, okay, Cavaliers haven't lost anything yet. They get two at home, they get even, and away we go. They still got to win in Boston. And after game one, they had three chances. And now after game two, they were blitzed in the second half, they got two chances. And game seven's historically a one by the home team. The Celtics never lose. I know it's different players, but the Celtics going back to 1951 never lose deciding games in their building. Very rarely. Deciding games. One year they lost the Knicks in a game five with Bird. I think that may have been the first time. No, it wasn't a, a game five. One year they lost game seven of the Knicks in 1973 when Dean the Dream Imager got went crazy. But uh, there's not many. I'm sure there's a couple of more that I. Well, the Philadelphia beat him one year in game seven, after uh, in '82. So there's probably a, maybe another one around the way. Not many. Not many. This team knows, and I love the way they play in that building, and they had a great second half. So Cleveland right now is in major trouble because they only get four cracks to win a road game, and now they only have two cracks. And even if they win the two at home, you know, Boston going to lose three games in a row? Let's say that the Cavs won those first two games, or won these next two games. The Celtics are going to be flying in game five. And then if you lose that game, then you got to win a game seven on the road. And yes, I know LeBron's sitting there, but still, that's a problem. Now, Speaking of LeBron, you know, that is, the, I don't want to pick on him because he did have 40 something points and he was phenomenal early in the game. Then he got smacked in the cheek and that was a big, you know, he got hit inadvertently, but that hurt. So I, I want to give him a little pass, but I, 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 it did dawn on me that it did remind me a little bit of game six about seven or eight years ago, the last year he had played in Cleveland before he departed from Miami, where he lost to the Cavaliers, lost to the Celtics, the Pierce Celtics, the Mike Brown team, 
where he looked disinterested or, you know, resigned might be a better word. And there was a little of that last night with LeBron in that stretch there where the game was won uh, in the second half, where he just, you know, when they needed a little calming, he, he didn't provide it for whatever the reason. He didn't get a couple of baskets. And maybe he was a little tired. He was a little, you know, tempered by getting hit in the cheek. Whatever it might be, that was a situation where he needed to go out there and basically, now he's done it so much, you can't get on him, and he's been phenomenal in his postseason, just ask the Pacers. So I, I, you, you, you hate to pick on him, and, he, and I would love to normally, but I want to be fair to him. I mean, he did score 42 points. I mean, geez. I mean, he was phenomenal in the game. I mean, the end of the first half, those are two big baskets, the Celtics cutting the lead to seven, and then in the third quarter, they went crazy. And LeBron would, did not do anything in that stretch to sort of calm everybody down. Mark Jackson alluded to it. He was right, and that did bother me. Jordan would not do that. See, Jordan would do everything in his power, his mental capacity, to settle the game down and get those four or five baskets that his team needs. LeBron got passive. Now, Kobe would do everything in his own power too, but Kobe was a volume shooter where, you know, he would just take the ball and shoot it constantly, and he was not, at times, a great shooter. Game 7 against the uh, Celtics, that Detroit series, he could have gotten, he got a little crazy at times. Jordan was a better shooter than Kobe. So you got to keep that in mind here, is that Jordan is better than Kobe. So I'll leave Kobe out of the discussion, and I'll leave it to just a Jordan. But from that perspective, that was a little blemish there with LeBron. Now, listen, Boston's better than Cleveland. So you can't go crazy with it. Boston's a better team. All right, they got better players. I mean, line them up. I mean, Love's played pretty well. I'm not going to knock him. But George Hill stinks. Jeff Green's not any good. Um, you know, George Hill you can have. Uh, J.R. Smith is, you know, so erratic. When the mood strikes, boom, he's dangerous. But you can't count on him. I mean, you know, Corver is a, you know, he can be a major factor, but only for brief periods. I mean, Love's a pretty good player. He's not great. He's pretty good. And then you got the all element of LeBron. Well, look who Boston has. I mean, Tatum is excellent. Jalen Brown is excellent. Rozier has come out of nowhere. Horford's an excellent all-around player. Horford's better than Love. He's an excellent all-around player. Obviously, you got Smart sitting there, who's very good. Uh, off that bench. Baines is a pain in the neck. I mean, and they got a great coach. I mean, and they got home court. I mean, Boston's better than Cleveland. I've come to that conclusion. I don't want to rule Cleveland out. And the one thing that Boston has shown in the postseason so far, they have not been good on the road, which does not bode well for them against Golden State, most likely, in the final. Because they're going to have to win a game in Golden State, no home court. Uh, Golden State had a better record. And they have to, obviously, if they somehow Houston won, same thing. Boston's not good on the road. They lost three in Milwaukee, and they lost a game in Philadelphia. They've lost four to five on the road. Um, so, And the game they won in Philadelphia, they easily could have lost. They won in overtime. So uh, let's let's knock Boston's a little different uh, uh, away from home. So you got to keep that in mind. They probably will have one opportunity. Now, Cleveland's played a lot of close games at home in the postseason. Indiana could have won a couple of those games easy. They won one. They easily could have won a couple of more. And Toronto could have won game three. So there will be a game there in Cleveland this Saturday and Monday. Remember, the NBA, uh, the NBA playoffs resume in 2020. There could be a game in the, I think there'd be one chance out of the two games, there'd be an opportunity for the Celtics to win one of the two games where, you know, it's last minute tight. I think they get that chance. And now if they win that game, the series is over in five. If they lose that game, I still think they're going to win because of the fact I don't think they're going to lose three in a row. So we'll see. I, I, you'd be floored if LeBron doesn't do everything in his power to win at least game three. But I thought Philadelphia would win game three, and so did the bookies, a nine-point favorite, and they lost. But I would be pretty darn super. They're going to get all the calls. The crowd would be into it. Uh, you know uh, you know how it is with uh, with cynics. Yeah, everybody knows that the NBA wants LeBron to continue to play, and, you know, the F, the, the officials know that too. And you know he's going to have to get every, he's gonna get every call known to man. You know that. Um, so keep that in mind. Game three will be hard, but Boston's going to be in the NBA final. I don't care what happens. Boston's better than the, than the Cavaliers. They're a better team. Better. And they're going to be in the NBA final. They're probably going to get blown out. 
They'd be a pain in the neck for a little while because they play good defense. It'd be a different look for Golden State. They'd be a pain. They have won in Golden State in the past. Two years ago, they won a regular season game there. They will be a pain in the neck. But, you know, they're going to the final. They lose, but they're going to the final. That's my theory right now at 17 after the hour as we continue on Mad Dog Unleashed.